If you do not have a sermon outline, I want to encourage you to lift your hand and let these fine gentlemen give you one. We want you to be able to have one in hand. If you're new to us this morning, you need to understand that we study the Bible. We're not here to entertain you this morning. We're not here to just give you nice sentiments or platitudes. We come to the Word of God to hear from God. This is how He speaks to us. This is how we come to know the truth. And so our, bi- our church um, takes that very seriously. Uh, lift your hand and one of these guys will give you a sermon outline. And if you're joining us online, I just want to say to you that you can simply click below this message and you can download the notes. Many of you don't realize that, even that are here this morning. You can go to our website and download the notes every Sunday, be able to print them out and uh, be able to remember and follow along. It makes it so much easier. Well, the risen Lord left an empty tomb. And I love images of the empty tomb. In fact, Marcy and I even have a a small tomb uh, replica at our home from Gordon's Calvary. It's one of the likely places where Jesus was laid and then rose again. And uh, we have one that's uh, a sculpture. And um, I love the empty tomb. But why is it so essential? This morning we want to look at the essential resurrection The fact that the resurrection is essential to our faith. And uh, we're going to see that through a special message. Now, when I think about first sermons, I think about a few different stories I've heard over the years. And one of them is Billy Graham. Um, Billy Graham has uh, really, really had a powerful impact on our country. And um, he died last year um, at the age of 99, um, I believe. But Uh, When he was very, very young, he started to sense that God was calling him to preach the gospel. And in fact, for those of you who are younger, unless you've looked around and gone and listened to messages from before, the Billy Graham that you heard over the last 20 or 25 years, you know, in his later years, was very subdued to the young man that he was early on. Uh, He was an energetic guy. Now, he, he didn't know a lot. And he didn't, hadn't been to seminary or anything. And his first sermon was preached not, not far from here in the state of Florida. And he was, in fact, ordained here in the state of Florida. But he, he prepared for that sermon and prepared for that sermon. He studied and he prayed and he talked to people, getting ready for his first sermon. Prepared all week long. Got ready. And that evening, he was preaching in an evening service. That evening, when he finally got up to preach, after they had finished singing, he got up, and I mean, he let them have it with both barrels. Everything that he had, he just poured himself into it. He went through all of his notes. He went through all of the main thoughts. And when it was all said and done, he went and he sat down, and he looked at his watch, and only five minutes had gone by. He let him have it all in five minutes. And he thought, oh my, do I get back up and do it again? He didn't, he didn't know what to do. That was his first sermon. Um, and uh, there's another great pastor that's had a huge impact in my life. He's a man named John MacArthur from Southern California. And uh, John MacArthur is on the radio, on television. Uh, when I was in college, I was listening to his radio broadcast every single day. I, would, in fact, would tape it with a timer back before the days of every, the internet. I would tape the thing, and I would come back to my, my dorm room and listen. But this year is his 50th year at the church where he is. Um, 50 years he's been teaching and preaching at Grace Community Church. Well, his, his first sermon was a little bit different He went, the first sermon that he ever preached at Grace Community, um, he and his wife were there. They were considering him becoming their pastor. He had just finished seminary, so a little bit different uh, than the the first sermon of Billy Graham. This was his first sermon at Grace Community. And so his wife, Patricia, was sitting there, and she listened to him preach while he was preaching, and it was all done. He sat down next to her, and he said, well, how was it? And she said, well, I guess not bad for an hour and a half. So Billy Graham, five minutes, John MacArthur, hour and a half. So don't y'all ever complain, okay? Um, I'm reluctant to tell you about the next one, Um, but I have to. My dad is here, and the first sermon, the first sermon that I ever preached here 
Um, it was Isaiah chapter 6, and um, did the best I could. Even at that time, I used the outline, a full outline, um, which kind of nobody does. And uh, so I preached, gave my heart to it all, and I didn't know how to end the sermon. I didn't know what, I didn't, I hadn't thought about that part. And so um, it didn't go on and on and on. I just stopped. I didn't have the sense to pray. I just looked at you all. And I said, Dad? Do you remember that, Dad? Dad was sitting over here somewhere where Betty is or somebody, and Dad stands up over here and makes his way, and everybody's going, oh, awkward. Um, It's just so weird. You know, first sermons, first sermons can be quite interesting. Well, this morning we come to the first sermon of the Apostle Peter. Now, we don't have a photograph of him because there were no cameras back 2,000 years ago, but we do have some paintings, some ideas, renditions of him. We do have movies that have been made about his life. But let's think about this and have your outline there. You want to see this. There's a big box on the page that's a little bit more than normal. Um, but we, we have his first sermon. And so we have it recorded. We, we, we have it through the gospel or, or the Luke writer um, of the book of Acts records Peter's first sermon. Who was Peter? Let's, let's remember for a little bit who Peter was. First of all, Peter was one of the disciples. And he wasn't just one of the disciples. This picture kind of shows him as being part of the inner core of the disciples. Do you know the names of the inner core, the ones that were with Jesus close all the time? If you read the Gospels, you'll see these three names keep coming up. Peter, James, and John. So Peter, James, and John were kind of, they were kind of closest to Jesus of the 12 and all of the other regular followers of Jesus. Very often in some of the paintings from the last several hundred years, Jesus is depicted in red because of his blood sacrifice for us. And so you kind of see that here, that here's Peter, James, and John coming close to Jesus, listening to him. But, you know, we we see as Peter is probably one of the most colorful disciples. I mean, he's always doing something. They're in a storm on the sea, and Peter sees the Lord coming And Peter jumps out of the boat, and he is walking on water. And he even starts to to doubt, takes his eyes off the Lord, and the Lord, he cries out, save me. And the Lord lifts him up out of the water. That's Peter. Peter did several other things. One of the things that Peter said was um, when Jesus was talking about being crucified, Peter said, oh, may that never be, Lord. And Jesus turns around and looks at Peter and says, Satan, get behind me. And so Peter, I mean, how many people have had Jesus say, call him Satan? Satan. I mean, we, we see this, this zealot heart of Peter. We see that Peter's one of the ones that says, I'll never leave you, Lord. I'll never leave you. But on the night when Jesus was being tortured before his crucifixion, Peter would curse and say, I don't know him three times. So Peter, with all of his zeal, kept messing up, messing up. We would often say that he was the open mouth, insert foot disciple. I mean, he just seemed to always say something that somebody had to correct. And he was timid and he was afraid and he was unfaithful and he would run away when the pressure was on. But we see that it didn't stay that way. And here is where we begin to see in the book of Acts that Peter's life really takes off. In fact, Christian history tells us that Peter, when they went to crucify him, you know, all of the disciples except John were martyred. They were put to death for their faith. Peter, when they came to disciple him, he said, or or to crucify him, he said, I'm not worthy to be crucified as my Lord was. Crucify me upside down is what Christian history says. But this morning, we've read the story of Peter running to the tomb. And here he is, Peter and John, They hear the report from the ladies, and this is one of my favorite paintings concerning Resurrection Sunday. And I hope you can kind of see it. There's this, there's this, oh, could it be? Could what the women have said, could that be true? Is he really risen from that? Is his body really not there? 
And it says that Peter ran, and John was younger, so John ran on ahead. And then they get to see the empty tomb. And we even read that he went away marveling at this, wondering, what does this mean? But we fast forward a couple months. After Jesus has seen, after Peter has seen the Lord with the other disciples, after he has been encouraged, but after he comes to realize, no, it's really true. He is risen from the dead. He's not dead. He's not in the tomb. Nobody stole his body. I've seen him. I've touched him. He even fixed me breakfast. You go read the story of what happens in those couple of months after the, after the Lord Jesus had risen from the dead before he ascended to the Father. We see that Peter takes on a totally different character. Peter, while still energetic and powerful, now is not, uh, no longer afraid to be associated. But now he's bold. And in fact, this text shows us his first sermon just days after Jesus has ascended to the Father. And he does it not in the outskirts of Jerusalem, but he goes to the temple to the people in the place that they had just crucified Jesus. Peter knowing that they may come and crucify him. But Peter goes to the temple and he goes to teach and to proclaim who Jesus really was in the massive temple. These pictures are actually of a model that is in Jerusalem. It's a massive model. Many of you have seen it before. It's almost as large as is probably... Uh, this entire sanctuary. It's a massive model in Jerusalem. And um, so here's the picture. Up there on the Temple Mount, Peter comes to declare who Jesus really was. Do you see your outline here? Acts chapter 2. Notice this here with me in verse 14. And I want you to follow along. Some of these scriptures will be on the screen. Others will not. We're going to skip through a little bit as we go. But notice Acts chapter 2 in verse 14. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words, for these people are not drunk as you suppose. Now, why would he say that? Here's the picture. This is Pentecost. This is that moment when all of the believers of Jesus had been there in the temple area, and then the Holy Spirit descends upon them. And as the Holy Spirit descends upon them, they begin speaking in languages that they had not ever previously learned. So that they were, they were from places all over the world, and as they began to speak in these languages, people were like saying, what is happening? And there were even, there were even flames of fire over each individual. Part of, I mean, there's a sound of a rushing mighty wind as the Holy Spirit, as Jesus had promised, would come. The Holy Spirit comes upon his people and people are saying, what has happened? Who are these people? Why are they speaking like this? What is happening? He's saying, they're not drunk as you suppose. It's only the third hour of the day. That means it's only about 9 a.m., Verse 16, but this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. So he immediately takes them to their Old Testament scriptures. And look what he says, 17, and we'll skip to verse 21. Look at verse 17. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. So God's spirit comes to dwell, comes to rush over the people. And in verse 21, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The name of the Lord. Circle those words. The name of the Lord. That's very important. All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You may want to put out there to the side Jesus and put out there. It means Jehovah saves or Yahweh saves. That's his very name. All who call on the name of the Lord, the saving God. Look at verse 22. Peter says to them, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with many mighty works and wonders and signs, all the miracles that you've seen him do over the last three years, that God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know. He's saying, you know you saw him feed those 5,000 people. You know that you saw the lame man that used to be over here at the pool of Siloam. He sat there for 37 years. And God, Jesus, 
caused him to stand up and walk. You know that you have seen people that were blind that now see. He's saying to them, everybody, you know what you saw through Jesus. Look at verse 23. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men, the Romans. What he's saying is, here we have the law of God as Jews, but the Romans don't have that law. They have their own laws. They're called lawless men. He's saying, you delivered him up, and you had him crucified by the Romans. Look at verse 24. This Jesus who that happened to, God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible. I love that. It was not possible for him to be held by it. And then he quotes again from the Old Testament in verse 25. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. Now look at this, verse 27. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. Right out there to the left side, Psalm 16. He is quoting Psalm 16, written by David, that is a picture of the heart of Christ. It's a picture of what is happening with Jesus, the Messiah. A thousand years before Jesus would be born, we see this prophecy of saying he's not going to rot in the grave. That's what verse 17 is about. Look what it says. For you, or verse 27, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You see, Jesus died, but he didn't stay dead. Look at verse 28. You have made known to me the paths of life. You make, you will make me full of gladness with your presence. Now look at this. He goes on preaching in verse 29. Brothers, I say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that's King David, that he both died and was buried, underline it, and his tomb is with us today. What Peter is telling them is, fellow Jews, we know that our great King David a thousand years ago, he was died and he was buried and his tomb is still there and he's still there. But look at this in verse 30. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he, would not, that he would set one of his descendants on the throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ. What he's saying is when David wrote Psalm 16, he was privileged to see into the future what God was going to do, that the Messiah was not going to stay dead. The Messiah was going to be the Messiah of life. And so we see that in verse 31, look what it says. He foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, that means into hell, nor did his flesh see corruption. Verse 32, this Jesus God raised up, and on that we all are witnesses. We've seen him. We've been with him for the last 40 days. Look at verse 33. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, that's what's just happened with them. The Holy Spirit has fallen on them. That's why everybody's wondering what was going on. He poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Again, he quotes David, verse 34. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Speaking of the ruling Messiah. Now look at verse 36. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So in verse 36, he's saying, this one who you crucified is Lord. That means he's alive. He's not still dead. In fact, we see in this text three times he's talking about the resurrection of Jesus. Three times Peter is declaring Jesus of Nazareth, whom they all saw, who they all knew what he was doing, and they crucified him through the Romans. Three times we see him saying, he rose again. He rose again. He's quoting David from the Old Testament. He's going to rise again. 
And so here we see that, we, that in verse 36 is this other reference to it, and he's saying, this one whom you crucified, he's Lord, which means he's not dead. Look at verse 37. Now when they heard this, so the crowd, the crowd in the temple, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, well, brothers, what shall we do? They're like, oh, we crucified him? This is who he is? Some of them were struck by that. They started to realize, well, we didn't believe when he was alive, and we didn't believe while he was here, but now through the coming of the Holy Spirit and through Peter, a fisherman, standing up, a fisherman that would once curse and deny that he knows God, standing up in the middle of the temple and declaring, this Jesus whom you crucified, he is Lord to the glory of the Father. Here we see that they are struck by this. Verse 38, look what Peter says to them when they ask, what shall we do? In verse 38, Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, underline it, for the forgiveness of your sins. You see, that's what Jesus did. He went to the cross for our sins. He rose again, overcoming our sins. We need forgiveness from a holy God. Repent and believe, be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Every believer in Jesus is given his Holy Spirit. Verse 39, for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. You can put out there to the side, us too. That's the, the Jews, uh, excuse me, the non-Jews. That's the Gentiles. That's me. And that's, I, I'm not Jewish, but here, I'm mentioned here. It's not just for the Jewish nation. It's not just for the nation of Israel, but it's for all who believe, including people like me who don't come from this heritage of the Jews. And so look what he goes on and he says, for everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. You see, God calls people to himself. Even right now, some of you are sensing that I need to get right with God. I need God's forgiveness for my sin. I need to stop messing around with God, going to church once a, once a year or twice a year. I, I need to start, I need, I need to get serious about coming before God and, and saying, Lord, I I believe in you, and I, I see that you died for me. I'm called to live for you. You see, the Lord calls us to himself. Derek's driving down Sheridan Street, and he's just, he's crying out to the Lord, saying, Lord, please help me to see who you are. Help me to know who you are. And he gets this strong impression, there, you need to go there. And so he comes, and he hears the word of God preach, and he hears that it's not about what he does, but it's about what Christ did. You see, God calls us to himself. So in verse 39, we see that. That for the promise is for you and for your children, for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Verse 40, and with many other wor words he bore witness. So his sermon wasn't this short. It was a little bit longer. With many other words he bore witness and can you, continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Verse 41, so those who received his word were baptized, and this is amazing, and there were about that day, excuse me, and there were added that day about how many? 3,000 3, souls. That's going to church right there. And that is outpouring of the Holy Spirit. All of these people realizing, wow, this Jesus whom we crucified, he was indeed the Messiah. And it's very, very interesting that many of them did not believe while Jesus was here, but they believed when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon them to believe. You see, that's part of what God does. He starts calling us through His Spirit to Himself. And we see that even as they see a, an uneducated fisherman getting up to preach and to dec boldly declare the gospel, we see that they come to faith. But we see that three times the resurrection comes up, that Jesus is not in the tomb that Jesus is alive. And I want you to see um, just three things here the very quickly this morning as we look at why the resurrection is essential. Why the resurrection is essential. Flip your sheet over there and look with me. Number one, the resurrection is essential because God promised it. The resurrection is essential because God promised it. In letter A, you see this. God said that Messiah or the Christ or Jesus will die and live again. God says that his 
Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one that's going to take away the sins of the world, he is going to die, but he's going to live again. We see this in Psalm 16, as we've just read. We see it in Psalm 22. We see it alluded to in Isaiah 53. And there's numerous other places in the Old Testament where we see it. But let's keep on looking here. We see it also in Jesus' words himself. So Jesus, God in the flesh, is declaring that he's going to die and live again. And I want you to notice these. I haven't included them on your outline, but they are on the screen. And I want you to see this. This is overwhelming. Over and over and over again, Jesus is trying to help the disciples see who he is. So he does miracles. He teaches them who God is, the heart of God versus the heart of man. And then he keeps saying these things about the future that they don't quite get. But look what it says in John chapter Two. So this is at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. When he starts his ministry, one of the first things he does is he goes to the temple and he takes all of their money changing, he takes all of their religiosity, and he takes all of their corruption, and he flips over the tables of the money changers and the people that are selling these sacrificial animals and everything else, and he screams at them, you have made my house a house of thieves and robbers. robbers. My house is to be a house of prayer. And so Jesus begins his ministry with this bold approach, and then we see Jesus make this statement. Jesus says this. Jesus answered them and said, destroy this temple, and he's not speaking of the brick and mortar temple. He's speaking of himself, his body. Destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. Verse 20, and the Jews said to him, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? See, they're being smarty pants. Look at verse 21. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. Verse 22, when therefore he was raised from the dead, ah, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the Scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. So they believed the Old Testament picture from David and Psalm 16 and Isaiah and other places in the Old Testament. But then they also were seeing that, oh, it's not only the Old Testament, but Jesus himself has been telling us that this is what is going to happen. So part of the essential resurrection is that God promised it. I want you to see where else we see it. In John chapter 10 and verse 17, look at verse 17. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. Wow. Verse 18, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it again, take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. So God the Father is giving God the Son the authority over physical matter and over life and over sin and over death. This is the glorious nature of Christ, God in the flesh, the Messiah, that he's going to lay down his life. No one's going to take it from him and he's going to take it up again. Look at Matthew chapter 16 in verse 21. We go over to Matthew's gospel, and we see it in verse 21. Look at the screen. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief, chief priests and the scribes, and look what it says, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. So Matthew remembers that. Matthew sees that Jesus started saying it, and he's saying it over and over again again to them, and they don't quite understand. Look at Matthew chapter 17, the very next chapter we see. And as they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. And they were greatly distressed, so they're starting to get it. You mean you, son of man, you the one who has come to deliver man from all of his trouble and his, we, we've come to believe who you are. What do you mean? They're going to put you to death? Look at the very next part, Matthew chapter 20 in verse 19. So you see over and over again, progressively we see this. And this is on the night of the last supper with the Lord. They, they've observed Passover together. And it says in verse 30, and when, they had hung, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. 
Verse 31, then Jesus said to them, you will fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Verse 32, but after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. So it, it's like, okay, last moments, it's about, he's about to go to the cross. Everything is about to change. They don't quite understand what all is going to happen. Jesus knew very well. Last week, we looked at the fact that he looked at Judas during that service. You remember that? During that, that Passover meal. And he said, Judas, go do what you got to do. And so Judas goes to sell the information about where they can arrest Jesus and to betray him with a kiss in the garden of Gethsemane. Right as this is happening, Jesus is saying, when they come to arrest me, you guys are going to scatter, but then I'm going to be put to death and I'll meet you in Galilee. That's up to the north. So he, he's already telling them, this is what's going to happen. And they're going, he's going to meet us in Galilee. Okay. Okay. My friends, what we need to see through these passages and many others is that God promised that the Messiah is going to die and he's going to live again. So one of the reasons that the essential, that the resurrection is essential is because God promised it and God does not lie. You and I may not always deliver on our promises. I mean, you and I are not always going to do what all we desire to do and what we say to do. There's things that come up. There's excuses that are made. God never makes an excuse. He always delivers on his promise, and his word is unchanging. It is forever. In fact, notice this, letter B, God never lies. Not as the father and not as the son does he lie. I want you to see these verses. This is so powerful. Psalm 119, verse 89. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. You see, his word is forever. Psalm 33, verse 11. The counsel of the Lord, Lord, stand sure forever. 86, 15. God is abounding in faithfulness or truthfulness. That's the idea. He's faithful. He delivers on what he says. He delivers on his promise. 1 Kings 8, 56. There has not failed one word of all of his good promise. He makes promises and he keeps them. 32 verse 4 of of Deuteronomy. He is a God of truth without iniquity or without sin, without injustice. And we all studied here just last year, Titus 1, 2, God cannot lie. It is impossible for him to lie because he is truth. And so we see that the resurrection is promised by God. And that is the first place that we can know that it has happened because God said so and God never lies. Number two, the resurrection is essential because it is the nature of God the Son. You see, the nature of God the Son is life, is eternal life. It is his very nature that he is preexistent and he is post-existent when it comes to the world standing. He existed before the world uh, was begun. He exists during the world being here. And he will exist when this current earth is done away with and that God establishes a new heaven and a new earth. Why? Because his nature is eternal life. This is the nature, and circle the word nature up there in number two. Circle that word. That's very important. This is the nature of God the Son. And what is that nature is? Eternal life. We see it in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15 through 20. Look what it says there in verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God. And I've underlined it for you. The firstborn of, pr- of all creation. For by him all things were created. You see, he was before creation existed because, and, and we see that he is the, uh, the source of creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. Underline the word before. He is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. It's as if Jesus is the atomic energy that holds every molecule together. That is the, the picture of who he is. The world holds together by the power of Jesus. That in everything, he might be, underline that word, preeminent. Preeminent. 
That means he comes before everything else. Why? Because he is the creator God. Look at verse 19. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things. So he brings everything back around to himself, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. So in his place of preeminence, we see this. The protocos, the protocos is this, the firstborn. You've heard of a prototype when Ford makes a new car and they say, this is the prototype, this is the first one made, this is the one that is going to be there. That's talking about chronology. This is the first one. But here we see that protocos is talking about not just in chronology, but even more importantly, we see this, it's first in priority. He comes first. He is the premier one. There may have been others that came before him. There may have been others in our little time um, uh, chronology here on earth that we see people come and go. We see things come and go. But Jesus is the one that is the preeminent one, and this is why he has power over death. In Romans chapter 1, in verses 1, and four, 1 to 4, we see Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Now look at verse 3. Concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the son of God, I love this, in power according to the spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead. You see, his resurrection from the dead declares who he is. The resurrection is essential because it shows us who Jesus is. He declares who he is by coming back to life, Jesus Christ our Lord. This makes it into the very beginning of Paul's great letter of Romans. You see where that is, Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. In the greeting, Paul is writing it. He's starting out there, and he's saying, this Jesus is resurrected from the dead, and that is why he is who he is. Look at number three. The resurrection is essential because of this, number three. The resurrection is essential because it shatters the stranglehold of sin and death. Now, we just sang that in the, last, uh, in the last song that we sang that says, you broke the bonds of sin and death. You broke the, change, the chains. And here we see it here that he comes and he, our greatest concern, our, our greatest um, fear that we could ever have is to go into death without Christ into judgment from God. This is into an eternal death. You know, I know that we often talk about having a relationship with Christ. And some people say, well, I didn't have a relationship with Christ. Now I have a relationship with Christ. Um, I, I often use that too. But I want to say this. The Bible makes clear to us that everyone has a relationship with Christ. It just may not be the relationship that they want to have with Christ or that they should have with Christ. Those who come to see who Jesus is and believe in him as Savior come into a right relationship with Christ. And that is a safe relationship to Christ to have. But those who do not know Christ and reject him, they are still related to him in that they have transgressed his law. And listen to this, they will be judged and punished by him. So everyone is going to be raised from the dead. No matter where you are on the planet, no matter where you are in human history, at the time of the day of the Lord for the great judgment of God, everybody is going to be given a body. They are all going to be raised out of the sea, out of the land, out of whatever century it is, and all are going to be raised to the judgment of Christ. Now, you better hope at that moment that your relationship with Christ is right and not broken. Because if it is broken and you stand before Christ without having his blood applied to your account, the Bible says you are being raised unto eternal destruction. 
Now, don't get upset with me about that. I know the, the whole idea of hell and everything else is very unpopular in 2019, but I'm not the one saying it. He's saying it. And we would do well to listen to what he says. In fact, by his grace this morning, you've been invited into this place to hear that Jesus is saying, just come to me and believe in what I've done. Come and see that I never will lie to you. Come and see that I am eternal life. That's the nature of who I am. And I am inviting you into a right relationship with me where I will shatter your sin and shatter the consequence of your sin and rain upon you a robe of righteousness and life and fulfillment. And what it says here is peace. Peace through his blood of the cross. And so, friends, I want us to see that he is calling us to faith and belief. And when we come to see who he is and we come to see what he's done, instead of all the confusion of Satan that wants to keep people, you know, oh, the church is just after your money. God is dead. He's not even there. I mean, whether it's Nietzsche or whether you, you name all the philosophers of the past or you name all of the various hoaxes and everything else that causes people to just say, nah, nah. Here we see that God cuts through that still, and he calls people like Derek and Cammie and Scott and Monica. No, I mean, you just, he calls us to himself as he is saying to me, come and see who I am, and I will shatter the chains that you can't shatter. And I will say that he who believes in me, though he die, though he die physically, yet shall he live and shall he live in eternal life. Look what it says. Now, I, I want, just want you to notice this. 1 Corinthians 15 is a great chapter for you to go home and read for your family before you go to bed tonight. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is all about the resurrection. It is, it is so great. And it's, it's, check this out, it's 58 verses. It's a long chapter. It's 58 verses about the resurrection. And so it's, we see that this is so important, and we see that this is being written to a church that's had a lot of trouble, a lot of trouble with sin, a lot of trouble getting along with each other, lots of, lots of issues in the Corinthian church. And so here we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. They need to see the power of Christ to break their sin. And maybe for me and for you, this is what we need to be reminded of as we see this. Look what he says in verse 3. He says, for I delivered to you, Paul is writing to the Corinthian people, and he says, I delivered to you as of, underline it, first importance. For I delivered you as of first importance what I also received. And here it is, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. Verse 4, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. So he died, he was buried, and he was raised. Look at, we skip to verse 14. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. So he's entertaining the idea that Jesus hadn't been raised from the dead. And now he's going to say the ramifications. If Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, is that a problem for us in what we believe? And he's saying, absolutely, it's a problem. Look at verse 14. If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. And your faith is in vain. In fact, the idea is, let's just go to the beach. Beautiful weather today. Let's leave. Jesus isn't raised from the dead. We can just go to the beach. I mean, it doesn't matter. Look at verse 15. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it's true, that the dead are not raised. Verse 16, for if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. Verse 17, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. That means you are still under the condemnation of your sins. That means before a holy God, you are not forgiven. You are not clean. But he's saying because Christ is raised from the dead, you can be clean. Look what he says in verse 18. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Now think about that. Now he's saying and for all of those who have been Christians, who have claimed who Christ is, were, were following Christ, and they've died, well, they're lost too. They're, they've perished unto their sin and unto the condemnation of their sin. Look at verse 20. 
But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits, there's that idea again of primacy, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So he's saying, everyone dies in their sin. Christ takes all of our sin upon himself and he is laid and buried. He rises from the dead. He overcomes it. And look in verse 49, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Verse 56, the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. Let's all read verse 17 together. But thanks be to God. That's only a few of you. Look at verse 57. Let's read it. Did I say 17? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. My fault. Verse 57. Let's read it out loud. Verse 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He gives us the victory because he is life. He is power. He has promised who he is to be manifest in our lives, to be a, a great fruit-giving, producing life. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. <laughs> Marcy, I'm going to tell them about your Easter outfit. Marcy said, you know, having an Easter dress is great and everything. I, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. Here's the, here's the deal. Priorities. I, I, I was talking to Marcy and Gina and others and, and Cheryl. Prior, you know, we, we used to think everything is such a big deal in the cultural Christianity stuff. And, you know, you got to have this, you got to have that and everything else. And, you know, Christianity is so much more than a, than a fancy Easter dress. Christianity is so much more than all of these little things that we make such a big deal of. When we get down to who Christ really is, we see that it's, it's not about what all the world thinks, what everybody else thinks. Amen. Marcy was just saying, you know, these things, there's other things that are just so much more important. Gina was saying the same thing. You know, I, nothing wrong with a nice new dress, nothing wrong with a suit, nothing wrong with a new car, nothing wrong with a nice house, nothing wrong with these things. But listen, there's so much more in Christ. Amen. So much more. <laughs> Notice this. Finally, in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, we see this begs the great question. There's a great question. I want you to see Romans 10, 9, and 10. Look what it says here. In verse 9, it says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, we're back to that issue of king of kings, primacy, the protocol. This is the one who is in charge of all things. If you confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, what does it say? You will, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. My friends, is Jesus Lord of your life? Is he the sovereign one? Is he really the one who shows you what's important? Or is it the culture? Is it all the advertisements? Is it the magazines? What is Lord in your life? Is it the risen Lord? The one that knows how to make eternity an eternity of life? Friends, I call you to believe upon Christ, to cast yourselves upon Christ. There would be no greater Sunday than the Easter Sunday to say, Lord, I finally surrender. Lord, I don't understand everything about this church thing, and I don't understand everything about this Christianity thing, but Lord, I am hearing that you are the Christ who can take away my sins. And I may not understand everything about that, but today I come to you and I turn from trust in anything else, and I turn to the cross. I turn to the place where you died and I turn to the empty tomb, and I believe that you are indeed Lord to the glory of the Father. Friends, you can believe upon Christ.
I call you to believe upon Christ. And you will find out what is truly, truly important in this life. Would you please stand together as we pray?